Hello and welcome to the SANS Cloud Ace podcast. Today I'm extremely excited to have with us JD Hansen, who is the CISO and the CIO at Code42. JD, thanks so much for joining. Thanks for having me. All right. Well, let's dive right into it. And like we do, we'd like to start the episodes with a little bit of personal history. So can you tell us a little bit about yourself, your family, kind of where you came from, and also you know, how you wound up eventually getting into cybersecurity? Sounds good. Um, well, let's start with how I got into cybersecurity. Um, this is way long time ago. Um, I actually got really interested in technology and computers like early in high school. And um, in high school, my technology coordinator at my school district allowed me to come kind of after school and he would teach me kind of all the things that he knew. Um, things were a lot different then, but um, kind of spurred a really, really deep interest that I had in technology and how computers work. We used to buy all the different computer parts for our computer labs and sort of like set them up in assembly line. Um, and I would put the computers together and assemble them. This is when we had desktops um, for different computer labs. And that just really sparked a deep interest for me to learn more about technology, learn more about computers, computer security, um, and decided I absolutely wanted to go to school for that and then have a career in it. So um, very few people know early that early on exactly what they wanted to do. Um, I was fortunate to really find a passion of mine and stick with it kind of through. Um, for From a personal standpoint, I'm married. I've been married for 19 years, I believe. Um, I've Congratulations. Three beautiful girls. Thanks. Um, next week is our anniversary, actually. Um, I have three three beautiful girls. Um, I have a, let's see, 15-year-old, 13-year-old, and a 12-year-old right now. Um, and so we are very busy. Um, it is sometimes hard to be a girl mom of teenagers, but um, every day, every day is still a gift. Yeah, amazing. Wow. So, you know, we, uh, it's funny, my wife and I, we just celebrated our 20th anniversary earlier this year. And uh, yeah. I also have three kids, similar in age, the oldest. I've got two two older girls, 16 and 12. And okay. then the youngest, we've got a big gap. The youngest, he's uh, he's four. So, yeah, wow. we got the whole age spectrum here. Yeah, you do. <laughs> yeah. Now, that's really interesting what you said about knowing so early that you wanted to get into security. And it's only in recent years that now there are degrees and master's degrees and so on in cybersecurity. But, you know, back when we were coming up back in the day, there was no such thing. So knowing that you wanted to get into this, how did you what what did you study and how did you find those paths? Because you kind of had to make it yourself, I would imagine. Yeah, absolutely. Um so when, when I went to school, I did a standard computer information systems degree, um, did some programming classes. I think I was like one class short of like a, a minor in computer science. And then, um, you know, I, I really wanted to finish school early. Um, I paid for a lot of it and so wanted to finish early. Um, I graduated after uh, three years and started working at Deloitte right away. And at Deloitte, um, we I joined a program that was called the Enterprise Risk Services Program. And it was probably the closest to a true cybersecurity job at the time. Um, I was doing a lot tied to security audit. I was doing a lot tied to security consulting. And so um, I I did a ton of pen testing. I, I will be the first to say I was not a great pen tester, um, but I did a ton of pen testing early on. I joke that a lot of times, like I was doing pen testing when nobody really even knew what a pen test was. Um, like they were vulnerability tests, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, people didn't people didn't even know the term pen testing at the time. Um, so a lot has absolutely changed, but um, early on, it you know, I it graduated from school and jumped right in um, doing that job at Deloitte. It's funny that you mentioned that uh, you, back then, even people didn't know what the term pen testing was, because I remember back then other IT leaders, they would say, oh, yeah, and we have to have a, a pen test done. And I didn't I couldn't figure out what that was for a few moments. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> 
Yeah. So, you know, you started over at Deloitte and that's probably the kind of best experience somebody early in our career, in their career could, could have and seeing so many companies and different businesses and interacting with different people. That's great. And, you know, now let's fast forward, you know, all the way to the, the present day with, uh, with Code 42. And we'll, we'll go back to what happened in the middle here a little bit later. But with Code 42, you know, I originally was uh, got introduced to Code 42, not as a security product, a security company, but we used it at a, in a prior life for more backup, right? But mm -hmm. Code 42 went through a change in, in direction in, in business. And you started out, I think, as that backup solution, but that was spun out into, into Crash Plan. And I think you were there for, have been there for all of this transformation. Can you tell us, you know, kind of what that journey was like and kind of what it meant to the business and what it meant for the security team and the, the IT team? Yeah. Yeah. We, we've been really fortunate at Kofri too. When, when I started and I started seven years ago, um, we had this business crash plan that really had a great, you know, great set of inter or ARR tied to it. And what we wanted to do was we took our series B funding round and, really invested heavily into a security product. Um, and that was, you know, that was close to seven years ago where we took that Series B funding. Um, we not only were able to use that funding source, but also a lot of the revenue that we were gaining from CrashPlan at the time um, to really springboard our security product. Um, the security product took a lot of the kind of foundational elements that, we had in place with the crash plan product um, and today um, built it into what we have today, which is a true insider threat slash data loss protection tool. Um, the crash plan business, about a year and a half ago, we decided, hey, these are two very separate businesses that need a very different strategic roadmap kind of tied to them. And so we ended up spinning off our crash plan business to another company. And we, I mean, from a technical standpoint, being the CIO as well, um, very technical very um, strong technical challenges because you're essentially kind of ripping apart systems to try to figure out how do we operate a company in a completely siloed fashion. Um, and so a lot of challenges throughout that year as we separated the two organizations, but now um, that organization is completely um, bifurcated from Code42. And Code42 today is still operating and delivering a, a really strong security product in the market. Um, the product at the very basis is around providing security teams visibility to insider risk exposures. So insider risk data exposures um, kind of across the organization. Now, you've got a very unique uh, role at Code42, because not only do you head up the security program, keep the organization secure, but responsible for technology in terms of the, being the CIO, but you're also heavily involved in, in product development, product direction, you know, as that vendor yourself with that hat on, you know, how early do you and your team get involved in even using your own products? And, you know, how, how do you get involved in their corresponding development? Yeah, th this is actually, you know, obviously a very unique um, role for me being a security operator as part of a security vendor organization. Um, and it's one that I didn't really know that I would enjoy as much as I do. Um, I love testing product. I love getting in the weeds of product, um, understanding how things work. And at the end of the day, I love delighting people that are part of the security teams, just like mine. Um, I think over the course of my years as a CISO, I have used many, many terrible security products. And if I can, if I can, um, be part of improving that experience for security teams like that that makes me so excited um there is like nothing better than hearing from a peer of mine like oh wow you your product really helped me out or your team really helped me out um that that means the world to me and so for for my role at cup for you too part of it is really working with the product team on what are we building so roadmap stuff first and then also like 
how are we building um how are we building things and is it meeting kind of ultimate goals of what the security user is going to expect and so um the roadmap is set our um our CTO delivers product and our team is kind of the the first line to test things and so we use the product fully internally as a as a true operational part of our um, overall security program. And then we test like all the different features functionality that are coming out in the product. Um, and then we have ongoing feedback sessions with our product managers, as well as our um, research and development team on, hey, usability of this isn't where we would expect it to be. And we kind of iterate through till we get to a point where um, the the user experience on our side is what we would expect, um, and ag again, it it's it's not it's not something I expected to like as much as I do. Um, again, for me, like, hey, we we helped um, make this feature amazing, and then to turn around and see customers of ours using it and getting the same value is is really rewarding. Yeah, very cool. You know, you mentioned, you know, not necessarily knowing that you would like this, uh, this part of the job so much, you know, after being in kind of operational security roles, technology roles for so many years, right? I think it must be refreshing to have a little bit of a change of pace, right? Probably keeps you saying a little bit. Yeah, yeah, it's a it's a different type of work. Um, just like the CIO job is a little bit of a different type of work. And for me, I, I mean, one of like my strengths is learning. Um, and I absolutely love like learning new things and trying new things. And so I think, I think that's probably why I like it so much. Yeah. Now in terms of kind of the product feedback, is that structured in your team in a certain way? Do you have a subset of the team that does that, spends most of their time on that? Or is it just other parts of the team given the, the nature of the product? like with the sock or with other parts that use it more and give more of that feedback? How, how have you set that up? Yeah, great question. Um, so not everybody on the team uses the product. So if you think of like what the product is doing, it is an agent on um, everyone's endpoint as well as visibility to all of our cloud data storage locations. So think like Google Drive or OneDrive or Dropbox. And the product is monitoring sort of every everything that an uh, end user is doing with files. And it's looking for end users who are essentially exfiltrating files out of the organization. So sensitive information, um, certainly information that the security team needs to have visibility to, but it, at the end of the day, it's sensitive information. So I don't want everybody across my team to have access to that. And so right now I only have two people that that really work fully into the in the product. And those two people are in charge of not only running the product operationally so we can keep a handle on data that is being exfiltrated out of our environment, but they're also in charge of making sure that they test each feature fully, making sure that they have the right relationships with the product product managers and providing that feedback on a regular basis. Um, and so those two people are the ones that we have as like the go-to to really create that, um, that bond with our development teams. Great. Well, it makes sense, especially uh, you know, doing all of this internally. Now, for other products that you might be considering from th other vendors, from third-party vendors, do you have a similar type of approach in terms of evaluating those uh, new solutions you might bring on board? Yeah, I, I don't know that there's ever a product that we don't do some sort of proof of value with. Um, and so every time that we're looking to purchase a new product or replace an existing product, um, First and foremost, I, I feel like every CISO does this. We talk to our peers um, and say, "Hey, what's working? What's not? What are you hearing? What's new?" Um, and we get we get a lot of peer feedback, and then we go out and we look at a few solutions, and we always do a proof of value. Um, is it really going to meet our needs? Um, we're you know a, a product that meets the needs of maybe a ten thousand person company might not meet the needs of. A smaller company and so we're evaluating you know what are the features functionality that are going to work for us um, before selecting a product um, i i think we're a hard grader um, i think that we we demand a lot i think the security industry 
at large demands a lot from the products that they use. Um, we're no different from our security team. We expect a lot. We demand a lot. We want um, the product to truly solve a problem that we have. And when we conduct a POV, we we make sure that the product does just that. Great. Now, um, in terms of your CIO role, if, if we switch to that, the uh, I believe when you started at Code Forty Two, you were you were in the security role um, only, and that CIO responsibilities came later. How did that happen? How did that transition come about? Yeah. Um, well, if I'm being totally honest, um, our CEO came to me and said. Um, the CIO is leaving and you're going to be the CIO. And I said, oh, hell no. <laughs> um, and then, you know, he, he had a great deal of confidence in me and, you know, is, has been a remar remarkable leader for me and has pushed me um, and really encouraged me to take on spaces that maybe I haven't felt like 100% comfortable in, but he's always known like, hey, you have the capability to do this. And so, um, after first saying no, I was like, hey, you know, if, if you still want somebody to take that on, I'm I'm up for it um, and jumped into the CIO role. Um, the team, the technology team has been very, um, very helpful for me, um, very accepting of me. I've been very transparent um, day one. I, I was like, I've never done this job. Please have grace with me. Um, I'm still learning. I'm going to do as much as I can to help you all out. Um, and that that role has been very surprising to me as well. Um, I think I had this perception of the CIO role um, that it was very infrastructure focused, that you would be, you know, you would be dealing with old infrastructure and old technology and trying to keep the lights on all the time. And you you wouldn't really get into a spot where you're very strategic. And it has been completely different than that. Um, for a smaller technology software company, I think what we've done is we've done a really nice job of selecting the best solutions out there that are SaaS solutions that can help our company enable our company to meet its business objectives. And that that makes a company really nimble. Um, it makes everything across the board really flexible. Um, if a software solution, a SaaS solution isn't meeting our needs, we can make a strategic change after a year. Um, and so I've been really surprised how much I've learned and so, how much I really enjoy um, the CIO job at Covery 2. Um, it is much more of a strategic role than I ever thought would be possible. Um, and for me, they, they, it's, it's been really, really fun to just understand exactly how our go-to-market teams work. So how does marketing work? How does sales work? How does sales operations support sales? Um, how, do how does finance work? What do they need to do? And really think through, okay, what are the applications, the SaaS solutions that they're using today? What needs to change in order for all of my peers um, in go-to-market functions for them to meet their business objectives? And that, that part has been incredibly rewarding. Wow, that's amazing. You know, you're really living the embodiment of what every CISO says they want to do in terms of helping the business and get product to market and understand those business objectives and what drives revenue and what are those goals. So that's that's incredible. The um, you mentioned uh, the various SaaS services and being nimble. Was Code Forty Two always cloud first from the beginning? Even you know SaaS and also you know AWS, Azure, you know infrastructure as a service. No, um, you know Code Forty Two is actually been around for quite some time. And so we've sort of evolved to be a full SaaS solution and a full SaaS company. Um, when I took over the CIO role, we had lots of homegrown stuff and we had a lot of applications running on, you know, bare metal servers in data centers. Um, we have absolutely evolved that and really um, taken that cloud for a strategy. Um, but, but, you know, seven years ago, we, we probably were not set up like that. What do you think has been the most uh, challenging? Like if you look back and say, oh, this is the mistake that we made from a technology direction in terms of shifting from that legacy approach, the on-premise approach to the, to the cloud and what might you do different? Hmm. That's a great question. You know, I don't know for sure if there was like a, a, 
a hard part with that. Um, I think from a product standpoint, one of the things that we're always challenged with is really trying to figure out cost of storage on-prem versus cost of storage in like AWS or Azure. Um, I think that's something that a lot of technology companies struggle with. Um, you know, you're you're sort of estimating um, cost of storage in a current point in time versus like, okay, what, what will our product look like two years from now and what will cost of storage be then? And so I don't know that, that it, there's one thing that was like really hard, but that estimating of cost in different architecture models, I think is like a challenge for, for every company. Yeah, very interesting. You know, we hear about the Dropbox, right? For example, that they were in the public cloud, but they decided to go largely uh, on-prem because of those not only storage costs and the corresponding infrastructure costs as well. So yeah, that makes sense because it's all driven by that business decision on when does it make sense to to incur those costs or, or not. Um, having taken on the having product responsibility, security, and you know CIO responsibilities, how does that maybe influence your thinking about the architecture overall and those various trade offs? Because certainly from a security perspective, we just think a lot of times, hey, you leave it to the engineer, they're going to deploy as many controls as possible. But you know, yeah, how how has that evolved over the years for you? Yeah, it it's a great great question. I think I have like deeper appreciation. Um, as a CISO, because I have the other two roles, and I'll, I'll give you a couple examples. Um, so because, you know, the, the CISO role is largely around protecting the organization based on the risk posture that the organization wants to take on. Um, and sometimes we sometimes get, we lose sight of the enable the organization. Um, and the CIO role, I think, is my reminder of hey, part of my job is enabling the organization. And as a CIO, you know, you, you take something like generative AI or AI ML stuff. And the CISO, because it's new, it's different. Um, it is potentially scary and we don't know all the risks. Um, the natural reaction is like, okay, well, maybe we say, maybe we say no until we can learn a little bit more. Well, the, the CIO job, you can't, you can't say no, you have to enable your organization like as fast as possible. And so it's a good reminder to me, um, having the CIO role that, Hey, this, this is what we need to do. And from a security perspective, we have to fit into that. Um, I think similarly on the, the role that I have related to engagement with development and looking at feature releases and user workflow and all of that, I think that part of my job, I have a much deeper appreciation for like what development goes through to get it right on the user side. And so as a CISO forever, uh, you know, I, I would use all of these security products and have these reactions like, why can't I do this? And this is terrible. And this needs to be fixed or that, why doesn't the product do X, Y, and Z? And being kind of in the weeds from a development perspective, I, I understand that. And I have a lot more appreciation from a, from a development standpoint um, tied to what I would expect as a user versus how hard it is on a product side. Um, some of the things that I think we think um, are so easy in the security products that we use tend to be very huge development challenges on the product side. And so it, again, on, on both sides, I feel like I've, ha I've learned a much deeper appreciation um, kind of in the enable the organization as well as deliver security products that like I can take into my role as a CISO. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, great. Have you seen any types of products that do a great job of meeting both the security needs and the IT needs? Oh gosh. Um, hmm. I, I guess hmm, that's a that's a really good question. It, in my head, I we have them very bifurcated, where a lot of our products don't do both. Um, I guess the the one product that we use on both the security side and the IT side um, is Jamf. Um, I feel like we we will do a number of security things and technology IT things um, with our Jamf product. Um, beyond that. To me, I, the products that we use meet so many of our needs, but they're very like 
either meet IT needs or they meet security needs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. I'm going to jump around here a little bit. You know, earlier you mentioned you started your career uh, at Deloitte. Um, where did you go after that? Um, so after Deloitte, um, I, I had my first daughter and I didn't want to travel as much as I was traveling um, and asked to stay local and to be on local accounts. And so local to me was Minneapolis and Minneapolis headquarters, many many fortune 500 companies um and target target corporation is headquartered in minneapolis and so deloitte had a very large engagement going on with target and i got put on the target account um, still working at deloitte but put on the target account and i absolutely fell in love with the culture i fell in love with the people um, at the time not not a lot of people know this about target but when i started at target we had two banks and then we owned all of our clinics and pharmacies. Um, and then we were also a retailer. So from a security perspective, we sort of had a perfect storm. We had banking, we had healthcare and we had retail data. Um, and <clears throat> one of my, um, you know, one of my mentors kind of describes me as like, I run to like a perfect storm. And at Target, um, you know, they were in like early stages of building out the security program and they had a lot going on. They had um, their PCI audit going on. They had their GLBA audit going on. And I said, oh, my gosh, this would be so fun to be part of this storm. Um, and so joined Target Corporation. I worked at Target for, uh, gosh, eight years. Um, and so I was at Target before the breach, I was at Target during the breach, and then I stayed at Target for a period of time after the breach as well. Wow. So that uh, must be a, a great experience in terms, I mean, hey, hard to go through during that time, of course, but seeing it before, during, and after. Yeah. Can you tell us about that journey and kind of how that impacted the team and, you know, kind of what, what you learned from it in retrospect? Yeah. Um, I could write a book on all the things I learned in retrospect, um, but I'll highlight just a few. Um, you know, going going through it, Target was no different than anyone else at that point. I, I think Target got a lot of negative press, obviously, but Target's security program was, was no different than anyone else's. Um, obviously, we were a giant retailer, and so we were seen, um, we, you know, we, we never really left the news cycles. Um, but the security program at Target was was not terrible um, at all. Um, prior to the breach, we uh, had issues, but no, no different than a lot of other people in our space. Um, during the breach, I mean, those were some really, really trying years. Um, we had periods of time where, you know, we didn't sleep for a few days. We had you know, lots of depositions. We, at one point we had like Bloomberg reporters, like camping out outside of people's doors or showing up at happy hours, um, trying to get information from people. And so it was, it was a really stressful period of time. Um, many people during that time left target security team. Um, but I, but I do think that the leadership, uh, that, was part of the security team, did everything that they possibly could to support the team, to change things where we needed to get change done, um, just just really be there for each other. Um, you know, a year post breach, we had, gosh, we increased the team by like 100%. Um, we had lots and lots of new software. We had new leadership. Um, it changed quite a bit. For me, I had a, a pretty large team afterwards, and I I really love like getting in the weeds. And so for so for me, it was it was time to kind of leave and try something totally new. Um, get back to kind of building uh, a new program um, and a program from scratch. And so that's what was super appealing to me to move over to Code for A two. Um, Code for A two at the time had Gosh, I think only two people in the security program, um, and we knew we needed to really build up the program, um, build out the team, start to get our certifications underneath us, um, start to have all those pieces that would be expected as part of a security vendor solution. And so 
that challenge for me was was really appealing and what what got me to move over. Great. You know, you mentioned uh, earlier, you know, Code 42 receiving, you know, funding, venture funding and going through that journey at like a start technology startup might. And you just said that you joined uh, and there was two security people kind of what stage was that? Was that Series B funding, C funding and so on? And, you know, yeah. How did uh, you know, how did you know that you wanted to join a, a startup at that point with perhaps an uncertain future in terms of how much they would actually invest in security? Yeah, great, great question. Um well, I, I don't think anyone has like a really clear answer when they're joining a startup. Um, for me, um, I was I was super excited about the mission. I think that the space that we play in, um, the data loss protection space, is one that is very ripe for disruption and buyers are eagerly awaiting a different way to approach this problem. And so that alone was really exciting to me. And at my core, I'm a builder. I like to, you know, build new things. I like to change culture. Um, that was really appealing as well. The, the, when I started at Cofrey 2, um, there wasn't a great connection between the rest of Cofrey 2 and the security team at Cofrey 2. And so I saw that as a huge challenge. Um, how do I change the culture of the organization so that they truly think of the security team as a partner. Um, and, and to me, like that, that's how we should be perceived in the organization. And so um, building that culture, building out the team, um, I, I had faith um, in our CEO, Joe, that he absolutely was gonna support us and get us the resources we need and the funding that we needed to build out the program. Yeah, you know, uh, common theme I'm hearing from a lot of the uh, stories that you're telling here is really one related to uh, leadership. You know, you mentioned, hey, your mentor at the time said, hey, you tend to run into the, the burning building. And, you know, you mentioned your uh, CEO saying, hey, you know, by the way, hey, I want you to be the CIO as well. You know, that yeah. coupled with, you know, that uh, lifelong love of learning, right, and, and wanting to uh, continue to learn and grow and, and build something, as you just said. So it's really, I'm hearing kind of there's that mentorship, but you also have that sponsorship as well. For that next generation of security professionals, next generation of security leaders, what tips would you have for them on, hey, how do they go about finding, getting this mentoring and this sponsorship? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. Um, I, I There's a lot of programs out there. Um, a friend of mine runs uh, Cybersity, which is a program designed for mentorship for you know, underrepresented people in the cybersecurity field. Um, if you're one of those, I, I would highly recommend checking that out. Um, but I also am like a firm believer in networking. And when you network in a way where eventually you meet somebody that you really, really click with and being bold enough to ask them for help and for constant mentorship is something I would recommend a hundred times over. Um, you know, there, there's interactions that you have with people um, that maybe have gone before you that you sit back and you think, oh my gosh, wow, like I want to be them someday, or I would love to be able to do that the way they did it. And being bold enough to say, hey, would you help me learn how you just did that? Or will you help me navigate this or that? Um is something that is not a comfortable question to ask, but a very, very important question to ask. And if you're bold enough to ask it, I can guarantee the person on the other side will not say no. Um, I think many, many security leaders just really want to see people succeed in this space. And so, um, you know, for me, like I'm, I'm mentoring like three different people right now. And as time allows, I add more people to the mix and help out as much as I can. I think, you know, especially um, women and underrepresented people in cybersecurity, it is hard to, to be in this field. And so as much as like, I can give back and, and I know everybody, all of my peers in, in this space, Frank, you included, um, I think we're willing to like jump in and give back um, to those that are that are looking to to stay in this field and to learn and to grow and to do great things. 
Yeah, that's uh, that is great advice. The uh, you know you mentioned Cybersity, and there's other organizations as well. You know what what do you think? You know, and certainly, hey, you're doing a lot from a personal perspective. What do you think it takes to get more women and people of color into cybersecurity and into these leadership roles? Oh gosh, if I knew the answer to that question, <laughs> I I don't know. I mean, honestly, I think it, it's just encouraging people. Um, I think it's being, you know, I, I think of myself as like, I have a duty to be a little bit more um, visible because I do think that like younger generations, if they see people that look like them that have gone before and been successful in this space, um, they're more willing to, to jump in. And so I think it's being visible. I think it's, um, you know, doing as much as we can to encourage that younger generation. One of the things that we do every single year is we do a partnership with Girl Scouts and we bring all the Girl Scouts into our office and we support them to get like our cybersecurity badge. And as part of that, we have a lot of the women cyber leaders um, get up and share their story and really try to be that visual person um, for all of this, these younger generations to see like, oh yeah, they, they were able to do it. Like I, I can too. Um, yeah, I, I don't, I wish I had like the answer to that. Um, but for for us as leaders, I think it's just about being visible and encourage them and supporting them kind of along their way. Great answer. Great answer. Now, um, before we switch gears here and go to the, a uh, little bit of a reverse around where, you, you know, I'll ask you to ask me a question. You know, I want to ask you one last thing here is what are you most excited about in cybersecurity, in the cloud security space or in technology overall? Um, so the, this is probably the answer that many people are saying right now. Um, I'm really excited about AI and it's funny because like my CEO is giving me a hard time, um, just last week about like, oh, you know, security people would, um, would sort of like put down everything related to AI and ML, um, and like, oh, what a joke this is. And if we hear that in a, in a, vendor pitch were like, oh my gosh, please stop talking about that. And that is 100% true because up until this point, it it was kind of BS. And now what we have now with some of the LLMs and some of the things we're seeing, it is, it is completely different and it is actually really good. And um, I can see how it's going to change a lot of the technology that we use, a lot of our everyday um, being as good as it is. And so I don't exactly know what the future holds, but I'm excited to see how things change with this introduction of what AI can do. Yeah, you know, like you said, it's definitely been a uh, somewhat of a negative buzzword in years past, even though machine learning to various extents had been used in some security products over the years, especially from mm -hmm. a kind of thought and sim and analysis perspective. But now, you know, everybody's been woken up with kind of a, the promise of, uh, of Gen AI. And, you know, where do you see, you know, let's in terms of two things, one kind of Hey, AI for security, right? Improving security mm -hmm. workflows processes with AI and then securing AI itself. Kind of what do you see, you know, it's still very early stages, as you said, but where do you see both of those going? You know, I'm especially curious about kind of securing AI itself, um, what, mm -hmm. what you've seen so far. Yeah, good question. Um, to be totally honest with you, I haven't seen anybody doing the securing AI itself in a really tangible way at this point. Um, I think what we've sort of seen instead is the vendors that are coming out with certain things, adding security with that. So if you take something like, um, I don't know, uh, AWS has Code Whisper, which is to help all the developers with writing snippets of code and whatnot. Well, one of the security risks is that all of that data is copyright. And so what AWS Code Whisper has done is they've put in a reference tracker and the reference tracker will tell you if the code has been copied kind of verbatim and where the code comes from. And so it's almost like a bumper to make sure that that risk of copywriting data doesn't actually come to fruition. And so 
to, to me, I don't know that there's like, oh, this is the product that's going to secure AI. I think a lot of the the products that that are now coming out that have AI included, components of AI included, are going to be pushed to also include the security aspects of them. Um, and so that that's how I think security of AI is is going to evolve. I think that obviously there's there's a lot of risk and um, there's a lot of things that could go wrong. And so I I think that vendors that realize that and build security in as they come out with the products are, are going to be the winners for sure. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Good answer. So yeah, let's switch gears here. Um, give you an opportunity uh, to ask me to put, put on the uh, interviewing hat. Uh, any question that you would like? Yeah, I I have a super simple question, but um, it it's super interesting to me. And as I think as I think about like the the CISO role, a lot of us think like, okay, well, what do we do next? Like, what do what do we do after this? And you have been a CISO, and then you moved into the advisor role for YL. Tell me about the transition. Tell me maybe some of the things you miss about the CISO role and then some of the things you love about the advisor role. Yeah, yeah, really good question. Yeah, so, uh, you know, having been a technology and security professional for the vast majority of my career over two decades, you know, it got to a point where, to be honest, you know, I got a little bit uh, tired, a little bit burnt out. And I knew, you know, I could see kind of at the end of the tunnel, you know, I didn't have perhaps, I think, uh, the the uh, it's always greener on the other side, but the you know the seeming luxury of you know having the product role that you have and the technology role that you have. So I was always thinking, well, what what could potentially come next? And you know, having spent the vast majority of my career at large enterprises, more so on the buy side of the table, buying and deploying many different tools and technologies, I thought, oh, you know, hey, being familiar with this environment would be great to do that with uh, with startups and get a little bit more familiar about that whole ecosystem. So over the years, I tried to learn a little bit more about the, the venture space and the, the startup world and uh, was introduced to a number of uh, great founders along the way. And now doing it on a regular basis, you know, I mean, hey, I got to say that what I love about it is that, hey, I'm meeting incredible people, you know, people that are a million times smarter than me every single day, having incredible conversations with them and brainstorming these different ideas. And just trying to support them, right? Playing some small part in supporting them along that journey of, you know, hopefully uh, making a difference for their various customers. And, but I will say, you know, hey, it's not always uh, rainbows and sunshine because on the flip side of it, hey, you know, you, you do miss, right? Kind of the day-to-day -day kind of operational uh, roles. And, you know, I, I, have, I find I have to work uh, harder actually to make sure that I'm up to speed on the, the latest because I don't have now a, a, a team that is doing these things on a day-to-day -day basis and by extension, right, learning what those challenges are with the team itself. Um, but, you know, from a kind of a, yeah, you mentioned learning earlier from a learning perspective and a growth perspective. Yeah, you know, I mean, I, I wouldn't trade it at this point. It's just been super, super fun. That's awesome. Yeah, one of the things I think about, um, you know, the, the CISO role, role you're, you're a little bit you have to be a little bit of like an adrenaline junkie to actually have the role. And I think about like, gosh, if you're not in a role where you're like, oh my, you know, the sky's falling, like fix, fix, fix. Like I'm, I'm wondering, like, do you, do you miss the, the rush of like log for J or the rush of that? Like, do you miss a little bit of like the, oh my gosh, we got to fix this immediately type of situation? You know, the, uh, we've the got wrong. many calls. Yeah, we've all got many calls and woken up at night, and you know these uh, mm -hmm. sometimes real incidents, sometimes you know false alarms, and so on. And for me personally, that's the part that I uh, miss the least. Uh, yeah. You know, and so you know, after kind of leaving kind of full time CISO work, I was doing some consulting, just independent consulting mm -hmm. on my own. And sometimes there would be some clients, potential customers that would say, hey, Frank, we would like you to be the virtual CISO, the VC. So that means, hey, of course, hey, if there's something goes wrong, we're going to call you in the middle of the night. Mm -hmm. And to be honest, I would turn those things to, I would turn down those engagements uh, because uh, after all those years of having to deal with those emergencies, uh, I was personally okay not doing it anymore. So I kind of yeah. find my thrill in kind of building it, uh, you know, in, informing the building of it correctly from the beginning versus the uh, getting woken up in the middle of the night aspect. I love it. Good call. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Hey, with the great, great questions, JD. That's uh, this is amazing. The uh, now, hey, to to wind things up here, you know, I wanted to ask. You also have a uh, a nonprofit, a nonprofit that's providing housing to families in the Dominican Republic. Can you tell us more about that? How that came to be, and you know what uh, what this organization is called and what it's all about. Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you for asking about this. Um, this is something that is nothing to do with my career, but something I'm equally as passionate about. Um, I, the, the, how this came to be is like a very long story. Um, we don't have another hour, so I'm going to give you the short well, version. The medium -length version. <laughs> yeah. Right. The, the quick version. Um, so in 2007, I took a trip to the Dominican Republic, um, was part of a team that was building houses there and came back and always wanted to, to go back and do more. Um, and then in, 2013, um, got a chance to go back with my sister and build houses and work in a really, really special area and came home from that trip and couldn't really shake the experience and decided, gosh, I, I really want to do more here and really want to make an impact. And so um, my answer was I was going to start a nonprofit and I was going to start to develop teams that can go down and build homes in this area. And that that's what I did. Um, it, at the time, uh, we were told like we wouldn't get our nonprofit status for at least a couple of years. We got ours in like two and a half months and we were off to the races. We have now built like 80 some houses in this area that we work. Um, and, and really we work with like a lot of like the local churches there and we send teams and the teams go and they spend about a week and they construct a home for families that are in an area that either the house is very unsafe. Think like, um, you know, a roof that is close to caving in or a dirt floor and the dirt floor causes all sorts of sicknesses within the parents and the kids or um, they they don't have a house at all um, and they need a place to live and um, the community identifies those families, and then we work alongside a number of volunteers to get families in safe housing. Um, and it, it's it been incredible. Um, it's, it's one of those things that is rewarding beyond um, words can express. And so it, it's a lot of fun. Um, we've been doing it now for um, gosh, almost 10 years. And um, we took, we had to take a short break over COVID. Um, the the community wasn't allowing anybody to come into the area, but we're back in action. And um, we were, we did have a, t a team tentatively planned for October trip. Um, and now we're going in April. So if anyone has a calling to go to the Dominican where it's incredibly hot and wants to come build a house with me, um, hit me up on LinkedIn. You are welcome to attend. <laughs> Incredible. You know, I've been to DR a couple times, but only in the tourist areas. Is this, uh, do you, are you building the houses on the northern side of the island, the southern side? Where Where is it geographically? We are southwest. Um, so you fly into Santa Domingo, which is on the south side of the island. And then you drive about three hours kind of northwest of Santo Domingo um, to a city called San Cristobal. And that is ultimately where we're, um, where we're trying to improve kind of um, the structure of the community, the physical needs of families, um, and just kind of the entire city overall. Mm -hmm. Great. And then a uh, last question about the nonprofit. Where does it, uh, where does the funding come from? Um, from all over the place. Um, mm -hmm. So we have kind of individual donors that have supported us. We have companies that, you know, want to do like a tax write off and they'll submit donations. Um, any donations can be made right on our website. Our organization is called Building Without Borders. Um, and so the the website, you can Google us. It's the first one that comes up, Building Without Borders, and then um, submit a donation via um, PayPal, right, right from the website. And so we get donations from lots of different places. Um, and a lot of times we get them sent direct for a trip. And so the, the trip that we're fundraising for right now is our April trip. 
um, where we'll be headed there the first week of April. And I, I forgot to mention this, but obviously it's a nonprofit, so everything is tax exempt. And then the one thing that is very, very unique about our nonprofit is every dollar that is donated is a dollar that goes directly to the Dominican Republic. So nobody's taking any sort of cut of money. Um, everything is volunteer run. And so uh, we're able to take every dollar and use that dollar for um, a house build in the Dominican Republic. Great. Well, hey, thank you so much for sharing. If uh, and To our listeners, if anybody is interested, please do visit the website and consider making a donation. JD, it was so great to speak with you. Thanks a lot for sharing your experience and your uh, your insights here. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Frank.